Yes, welcome along to another episode of the Play On Scottish Football Show, your weekly instalment of all things Scottish football. I'm David Simmons, as always, delighted to be joined by Anthony Brown and Stephen Commons. So make sure you stay tuned for the next hour as we look back on the weekend's Scottish football in action, highlights and key talking points as well. On tonight's show, we're going to be discussing how close Celtic are to appointing a new manager and what is the future for Robbie Nielsen at Tynecastle. All coming up in the next hour, plus so much more, so make sure you stay tuned. But we do want to hear from you guys, as always, we are fully live, we're fully interactive. I say this every week get your comments in we'll touch on any of them which are relevant uh, some of them can be a bit off topic so do keep them to the, the subject matter if you like but on tonight's show we will discuss everything that's happened over the weekend and more don't forget if you are watching via YouTube get online and subscribe to the State of Mind YouTube channel and also get on over to Twitter give the show a follow and it's a play on um, Scottish Football Show give it a little follow on Twitter and help us grow the show so it's been quite a quiet week actually Stephen it's been Easter weekend obviously good Friday and now we're on Easter Monday so I didn't know that the, the outlets weren't populating that much breaking news today, They're probably all on Easter Monday holidays. But one thing that came out, obviously, Dominic Mackay, he's set to start work as the new chief executive at Celtic three weeks, eh, three months, sorry, ahead of schedule, having already agreed to take over from Lawwell in July. Um, do you know much about this appointment? Do you know when it's going to be taking place? Or um, I don't think, any, obviously, anyone knows anything official, but the, the word on the street is that he will be... Uh, he will be presented to the stock exchange <coughs> tomorrow, which obviously at the level that he's working at, they need to do that because Celtic are a, a public limited company. Um, I think it's, it can only be construed as good news for Celtic, to be honest. I think he, uh, we've been saying since the, since they had sort of announced that he was going to be taking on his role, we'd been saying, well, we understand he's got a job to do at the SRU and he's under contract there, but surely Celtic could pay... <sighs> I don't know, compensation or whatever the, the deal may be. And it's, it's no coincidence that he was obviously at the SRU, the Six Nations finished last weekend. Um, I don't know whether that's maybe been the the thing that's been holding this whole process up, that Celtic didn't want to pull the trigger on a manager or, or director of football or coaching staff or anything like that until the, the this guy had been put in place. And maybe the plan all along, was to kind of just keep them ticking along until after the Six Nations, until they could maybe get Dominic Mackay into position. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. If he is announced tomorrow, it'll be very interesting to find out what happens over the next couple of weeks and see how quickly Celtic start this rebuild. But if I was a Celtic fan, I'd be very excited by this because it does sort of show intent from the club. It's, they're not just sitting back on the laurels, which I think a lot of people have accused them of, of doing. And if, uh, if, if rumours are to be believed, then he'll be in tomorrow and we may have a new manager in the, the Celtic dugout in, a, in maybe the, the following days or weeks after that. Yeah, I don't know if that, were, that pun was intended. You're going to see how quick he can... <laughs> Sorry, you know, David, my, my brain does not work on the same level as yours. <laughs> constantly looking for a pun, eh? Yes, uh, well, Anthony, you can see where I was going with that because Eddie Howe is obviously the, the main man in the in the hot seat. He's been touted as being the next Celtic manager. If that is the case, I mean, how big a, a signing is that going to be for, for Celtic? Yeah, I think ever since Neil Lennon's position became a source of doubt and ever since he left his position as Celtic manager, Eddie Howe's name's always been the most prominent one in the in the discussion, I know uh, Rafa Benitez, his name's always linked, and he was seen as probably the big dog if they could go out and hire anybody within realistic um, as a realistic target, then some people wanted Rafa. But I think realistically, Eddie Howe has always been the standout oh, realistic been candidate been in, this, um, in this procedure. Uh, so I think... There was obviously a bit of chat about Roy Keane last week. There's an echo in my ear, Sammy. Is. It's not, actually. It's me being a, a very bad professional, to be honest, guys. I'm trying to share the show on social media, and it's playing oh, right. back on my phone. So I have to take full credit for that. That's my bad. <laughs> See, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to grow the show. So if you're watching it as well, give it a share on social media. So, Anthony, um, yeah, well, I do no, apologise. I, I, I think Eddie Howe, um, has, from the moment Neil Lennon left his job, I think Eddie Howe has been the, the standout realistic candidate for the Celtic job. And I dare say he won't, his appointment won't please every single Celtic supporter. But I think in terms of getting the majority on side, this is probably the only one that really made sense on most levels. I mean, obviously, there's still question marks about the fact he's never managed a club as big as Celtic with the demands to win every week and all that. Um 
and he's never experienced the intensity that will come his way when he becomes a Celtic manager. But I think I read an article on Saturday there, um, and I'd sort of touched on this before, uh, by Stephen McGowan in the Daily Mail. Eddie Howe is probably as close as they could get to a Brendan Rodgers type appointment. So I think it, it makes sense on most levels, this one. Yeah, I'm just looking through some of the comments. I mean, uh, Eddie Howe, yeah, he, he's a talented, here we go, sorry, here it's here. Eddie Howe is a talented and progressive young coach, once touted for huge jobs down south, including the England international job. Uh, let us just appreciate what a huge appointment this will be. I mean, if it does go through, Stephen, it is, would you say it's on the sort of same part as Stevie Gerrard when he went to Rangers? Very different, very completely different appointment, to be honest, because Eddie Howe had no footballing career, really. I mean, he, he played in the lower levels and I think he had to retire early through quite a serious injury. Um, his story is his story's a really, really good one. It's a really sort of rags to riches story that he was a, a lower league player. He was the captain, I think, at, at Bournemouth at the time. Bournemouth were bottom of, the, of League Two, as it stands now. They were in minus points. They, they had gone through a, a raft of kind of short-term managers and he obviously had to retire through his, his knee injury, was was on the coaching staff and then was kind of just pushed into the line like to say, right, no, you run the team now. And on the last day, they managed to, to stay up. I think the boy Steve Fletcher, who, who then went on to become part of his coaching staff, scored a goal in the 89th minute to sort of keep them up on the final day. And then from there on in, he, he just he took them from basically minutes away from being out of the Football League in England to Premier League within... I mean, he obviously left for a, a period, I think about 18 months, he left to go to Burnley. Didn't like it, didn't like being away from his family and stuff, so eventually after 18 months went back to Bournemouth because they, they had gone through a kind of short-term thing and, and got him back. And the rest is history. He took, he took a tiny club, I mean, a, a club who've got less season ticket sales than Hearts, Hibs, Aberdeen, and took them to the land of the giants in England and, and, and held his own. I think they finished ninth in, in his uh, in his seat, first season there. And he, he worked miracles, to be honest. He he, he did he did what what only managers can only dream of really. And took a tiny club up to the to the, the, the top end of European football really because Engl the English league is such a, a high profile league and such a such a obviously well financed league. So it's a completely different situation to Gerard. He's probably earned his stripes in terms of management. He doesn't really have a, a, a playing career to kind of fall back on if, if players are kind of going, who's this guy? But he he has got a CV, a strong CV of of sort of getting the best out of a group of players. So I mean it's a completely different kettle of fish coming to Celtic there's, there's no debate about that so he will come to Celtic and he's gone from Bournemouth plucky little Bournemouth and playing in the Premier League to now coming to the one of the giants of Scottish football who come hell or high water need to win every week every yeah. single week so it is a, it's a completely I, I saw a lot of people try to compare Eddie Howe to Brendan Rodgers and A I think it's, it's very unfair to try and do that and, and, but B also Brendan Rodgers had managed at Liverpool. He had managed at a club who, again, doesn't really matter what, where they were at the time when he managed them. They, they are expected to win every week. They're a big club. So he knew the, the kind of how, how to manage that expectation level. Eddie Howe doesn't have that. But what he does have is, is he, as, as the, the contributor said, he, he's, he's a progressive young manager who, who at every step has managed to get the best out of the group he's, he's had and also add to the group and, and and know how to add in the right ways. He, he hasn't gone out and bought superstars who've, who've rocked, rocked the apple cart and upset the rest of the, the team, but he knows how to get the best out of a group. So, and, and I think given the, the position Celtic are in and the, the rebuild that they have to do, I think that's a, it's, it's a great thing to have in your CV. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing that Richard has put here, um, compared to the English Premier League um, league club, sorry, and in Europe, Celtic are not rich. Celtic cannot compete with wages, transfers, etc. Celtic need a manager that can make strides with respectfully little. How did that at Bournemouth? Which is correct. I mean, it just fits the jigsaw, doesn't it, Anthony? I mean, how important is it, though, for Celtic fans maybe not to expect too quick a turnaround with a new appointment. It needs time for the new manager to bed in, to make his own sign-ins. I mean, it took Stevie Gerrard, what was it, three seasons to get to where Rangers are now, isn't it? Yeah, it has. But equally, just by becoming manager of an old farm club, Celtic or Rangers, you automatically there are probably unrealistic expectations on you at times. And I think regardless of 
the backdrop, regardless of the situation he's inheriting, there will be Celtic supporters who expect and demand that Eddie Howe wins the league in his first season at Celtic. Whether that's realistic or fair is another debate, but I would argue Celtic will have a strong budget in comparison to Rangers, and they will still have very good players. Even the players that are going to be left, you're still going to be left with McGregor, Turnbull, Forrest. Yes, there's going to be a major rebuild, but there's also going to be good players left in scope to bring in good players. Obviously, the thing that a lot of supporters may not factor in is the time it will take to gel a new team, because that that is something that generally, occasionally you'll find you can just throw a team together and and it clicks. But generally speaking, you do need that time. Whether the supporters will afford them that time, if, for example, Rangers are 10 points clear of Celtic in October, November, I think we'll be having a, a far different discussion about Eddie Howe. If that was the case, I think Celtic supporters would be saying, what's going on here? What's all this about sort of thing? I, I'm not sure he will get that time. I think just he's going to have to find a way of having a competitive Celtic team that is ready to not necessarily hit the ground running, but at least be capable of winning most Premiership games and making some sort of impact in Europe um, from the from the get-go sort of thing at the start of next season. I, I don't think as Celtic and Rangers manager, you, whether you should or shouldn't get leeway, I don't think you get leeway as Celtic or Rangers manager. They, Generally speaking, Celtic or Rangers supporters don't allow you a free season to find your feet. I mean, Ronnie Dyla was probably the last Celtic manager that really got that scenario, but he got it on the basis that he knew even during that period he was still guaranteed to win the league because there was no Rangers in the league. So he had a free pass in terms of almost being able to find his way into the job and and trying to adapt to the demands and what was expected at Celtic. But equally, he, he won the league both years simply because Rangers weren't in the league. So Eddie Howe's not going to have that luxury. He's going to have to find his feet in this demanding environment but also be right up against a, a really rampant um, Rangers team who are in a good vibe at the moment. And I think most people are expecting this Rangers team to kick on, assuming Steven Gerrard's still leading them next season. Yeah, definitely. Stephen, I've got two comments to show you before I ask the question. We've got one here from David. The dragging on with how is a worry. Crystal Palace and Newcastle jobs are coming up. Why so long? Jim's also put as well that Beal is the man behind Rangers success last season. Gerrard was only carrying the water bottles. A wee bit of a, a pun there. I mean, we know that Beal is obviously very highly respected at Rangers uh, yeah. for the work that he does. Um, going back to David's comment, why is it taking so long? Is it a case that Eddie Howe is trying to put in the right backroom staff before he gets going? I know there's been the question about the director of football um, opening opportunity at Celtic as well is that maybe why this is just taking a while to get across the line then you factor in of course the Dominic Mackay transfer coming in and out is that maybe um, Celtic fans being a bit too impatient with it all no to be honest I, I agree I agree with that comment I agree with I mean Eddie Howe's been out of work since August August 2020 he left his position as Bournemouth manager he has been unemployed completely and utterly since that time he's, he's not been consulting he's not been doing anything so if, if he was the man and he has been the man all along, which Celtic will no doubt say when he when he is eventually appointed, or if he is eventually appointed, they will say, "Oh, he was always number one on our list." That that to me makes it more laughable that they have taken so long to get him in position. The the, the chat that I was reading, like so, the the thing that you were referring to there was obviously the fact that he is very keen to bring in Richard Hughes, who is a guy he worked with. He, he first and foremost he played with at Bournemouth, um, who. <laughs> It worked as a technical director. Um, so uh, as much as you're saying the backroom staff, I think the technical director role is one that Eddie Howe worked with, I think pretty much the entire time he was the Bournemouth manager, even when they were in the, the kind of lower leagues, he still had Richard Hughes doing whatever role it was that he, he was doing. So if he's coming in as part of Howe's backroom staff, then fair enough. But I think Celtic still need to press on with this idea of having a director of football. They've obviously got rid of Nicky Hammond during the week, who has chosen to move on, if, if, if you believe the press statement. Um, he was recruitment, so they are freeing up things or, or roles and positions. Because obviously people have said that, that Peter Law has been like a pseudo- director of football for the last few years anyway. So the fact that Peter Law's moving on, the fact that Nicky Hammond's moved on, they, they do still have a position there, I think, for a director of football. But it's all very confusing at this moment in time with Celtic. I think having this chief executive in place tomorrow or whenever it may be will be the start of them 
begin to show their hand to everybody else. Obviously, I think within within the walls of Celtic Park and, and Lennox Town, they will have known for probably quite a while what they were going to do and, and what structure they were going to go with. And if by employing Eddie Howe now, they then have to b- maybe potentially change the structure of what they were going to do in terms of a coaching staff, a technical director, a director of football, then that might be what's held it up slightly. Um, again, the same article that I was reading was 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 almost sort of hinting at the fact that that the the, the existing coaching staff might might stick around because Eddie Howe's existed well the, the the coaching staff he had at Bournemouth was well his assistant was Jason Tyndall who then went on to get the job at Bournemouth and now was now he's working at Sheffield United so. He, whether he can just pick up the guys he had before and say, right, guys, we're going to Celtic now, here we go, or whether he maybe has to box a little bit more clever than that and try and find a, a, a new balance, whether it be the existing staff or, or bringing in people that he potentially hasn't worked with before. But what a sort of a combination of those two comments that you showed earlier, the second guy who said about Michael Beale, I think that's, a, that's very important because... Obviously, Brendan Rodgers had Chris Davies. Uh, Gerard's got Michael Beale. They need a kind of head of coaching that's going to do the day-to-day stuff on the training ground. And from from what we've seen and what has happened this year, neither John Kennedy or Gavin Strachan seem to be that man. So why Eddie Howe would choose to keep these guys around, I don't know. But again, it's purely speculation. We won't really know or be able to kind of comment properly on it until it's announced. Yeah, no, I mean, the next coming week should be very interesting. Uh, hi to this gentleman. I seen the other day that Bournemouth centre-back Steve Cook's a free agent uh, in July. He's 29 years old, and I think Eddie will go for him. So, I mean, if Eddie does come in, that's one that he might look for. I mean, Anthony, recruitment um, for the new manager, whoever that may be, if it is Eddie Howe, uh, is going to be a huge job. One of the positions, obviously, that probably needs to get sorted at Celtic is the goalkeeper. I mean, Barkas has now been linked uh, about going out on loan to a Greek club. Um, you mentioned the likes of Turnbull will be staying, Christie. Um, Forrest, etc. McGregor, by the looks of it, at Celtic. I mean, everybody else should probably be worried for their place for new management coming in, don't you think? Yeah, I think every single player, probably with the exception of a couple of those you just mentioned, will be under the microscope in terms of their Celtic future. But certainly the goalkeeping one has been a, a problem position all season. Uh, we've discussed it before about the the merit or not of letting Craig Gordon leave. Obviously, they assumed they were going to get Fraser Forster. Um, they then went out and spent a few quid on Barkas quite a lot by Scottish standards for a goalkeeper and it's not worked out and uh, so it sort of almost underlines the problem of finding a goalkeeper that's good enough for Celtic I mean they've spent 5 million quid and it's not solved that problem it's not got in a keeper of the calibre that they would have been looking for so that that's going to be a problem for them going forward because they need to have a good goalkeeper and there's nobody obvious out there. I mean, I know we've spoken about the Dundee United goalkeeper in the past, but even then, as good as he is, there's no guarantees he's ready to step up and be Celtic's number one week in, week out, just with the mentality of having to be in that pressured position. That can make good goalkeepers well. You need a real, you need to be a quality goalkeeper in terms of ability, but you also need to have the mentality to be able to handle the pressure and scrutiny of that position. So, I mean, that's the problem Celtic are going to have right across the board finding players that are not only of the required quality, but they also have the mentality to play for Celtic. They, they can cope with the 60,000 fans at home games. They can cope with the constant scrutiny, the demands to win every week, regardless of whether you're playing well or not, finding a way to win. I mean, these are things that a lot of players, they can look really good in certain teams and then you bring them to Celtic or a club of that magnitude and they just can't handle the demands of needing to win every week. And the other problem Celtic have got is whenever Celtic have recruited in recent times, they've generally been adding to a winning team. So, for example, when Brendan Rodgers took over, he had a team that had just won the title under Ronnie Dyla. The team wasn't perfect by any stretch, but he only added a couple of players. If I remember rightly, I think it was just Scott Sinclair that came in that first summer. And it totally, because he got the right mentality into the guys that were already there, added Scott Sinclair and he just managed to impose his philosophy and his mentality on the team and they sort of took off from there. Whereas here, you're not going to have that winning mentality as such. You're going to have a few players who are used to winning, but generally it's going to be a new team you're building, I would imagine. Um, On the basis of, let's say, 
you've maybe got four or five max, four or five maximum are going to still be there next season in terms of guys who are featuring regularly this season. You're losing Scott Brown, who's been the driving force of that Celtic team for the last 10 to 15 years. How do you get that mentality back of, we are Celtic, we need to win every single week, regardless of who we are playing. We need to go to Ibrox and win. That's not something that just happens just by throwing good players together. You also have to have that that mentality of, we are Celtic, we will go there and win the game. And that's something that has to be nurtured. And that will ultimately, that will come from Eddie Howe and whoever else he has with him in terms of his coaching staff. But it's not going to be easy. If you're signing guys from England or from abroad, or even from other Scottish clubs and putting them together, you then not only do you have to get them blended tactically as a team, you also have to ensure they have the right mentality to go and challenge and make sure they're winning that league. And that's going to be easier said than done. That's what makes Celtic's recruitment this summer really difficult, getting the type of characters that are going to be able to not only handle it, but embrace the pressure. Because, I mean, they bought Shane Duffy in this year and by all accounts a really strong character, but obviously he's had these off-field troubles. He's had a really difficult time of it away from the pitch. And to be honest, he's wilted. And people will slaughter him for that. But ultimately, he's a human being, the same as every single player Celtic are going to sign. People are, they have these sort of vulnerabilities and weaknesses. And if things are not quite right, then good players can wilt, especially at a club the size of Celtic. And that's where the, the recruitment is going to be a real challenge. So Eddie Howe has got to create a positive vibe in a very short time for new guys coming in to allow them the best possible chance of sort of finding their feet and doing themselves justice in the short term. Because you know what it's like, as soon as a, a player arrives at Celtic or Rangers, they have a few bad games and they're written off as a dud and it's very hard to reverse that. So that's what the new Celtic manager is going to be up against. His recruitment is, I mean, a lot of it will be down to luck in terms of as much as you're hoping a lot of it is based on skill, ultimately it depends on each particular character, how they handle coming into Celtic and how they deal with the the mental demands of this environment. Because to be honest, it'll probably be completely different to anything they've ever experienced before at any other club. Yeah. No, so they need to they need to learn from the mistakes. Of, like Shane Duffy is a perfect example. Of, like obviously the story about Steve Cook, whether that's true or false or, or just lazy journalism that they've put two and two together and that Eddie Howe will know Steve Steve Cook inside out, right? Because he, he's had him for years and years. He's, he's brought him up through the leagues. But what the, the thing that they need to learn about Shane Duffy is that Shane Duffy, people looked at Shane Duffy and thought, oh, he's a big, strong Irish defender. He's a big Celtic fan. He's played in the Premier League. He'll be a, a great fit for Celtic. But what they didn't take into consideration is a very, very simple fact is that he's gone from playing for Brighton who were used to being on the back foot in pretty much every game that they played in England. And he then came to Celtic where he's expected to be on the front foot. He's expected to get the ball and drive out from defence because that is the way that Celtic play. And the teams who come up against Celtic are not going to dominate them. They're not going to dominate them possession-wise, physically, nothing. So he's gone from... It's basically apples and oranges. He's, he's gone... Although it's the same game, it's a completely different prospect playing for a team who are constantly on the front foot rather than a team who counter-attack. So if Steve Cook is a player who Eddie Howe deems as being, well, I know mentality-wise he will he will be able to kind of handle this, but also I know what, how good he is on the ball, how like his leadership qualities, things like that, that's fine. If, if he thinks that he's good enough to come in and, and play, then brilliant. But they need to look at those simple facts. It shouldn't just be, where has this guy played? What's he done? What's he won? They need to look at the, the actual ways that the team is going to play and build a team around that, which is why it's important before they do any recruitment. And I know they've brought in the guy, Liam Shaw, on a pre-contract from, from Sheffield Wednesday. But again, I think he's more a kind of deal for the future. But it's important that, that Eddie Howe or whoever the manager is going to be comes in and has a clear plan of how he wants his team to play and buys players accordingly, not try to put round pegs and square holes or the other way around. That's what it's supposed to be, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, just looking at some of the comments. Um, this was before you actually mentioned it, Anthony. This one come in. I'd go for the Dundee United goalie. I think you'd do a good job. I mean, he has had a great season. I, I, I think By the way, good. Who, who was Eddie Howe's goalie? Number one goalie for, all, for years and years. Zex. I'll give you a clue. Bekovic, the goalie, goalie. Oh, the of course. Goalie, Arthur Boric, yeah. He, he's coming in as goalie coach. There's my tip. There's my tip. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Go for the Dundee United goalie. Um, someone's saying, what about the Hibs goalie? Marciano. He's looking to get away, isn't he? Do you think he would fill the 
the goals at Celtic though, Anthony? Is he, is he that calibre of goalkeeper? He's international, but uh, I'm not convinced. I'm not. I'm not saying he wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, he's a good goalkeeper for Hibs, but again, it's it's a totally different level being the Celtic goalkeeper to being the goalkeeper for Hearts, Hibs, Dundee United, Aberdeen. Out, it's a in many ways see any player jumping up a level. It's a guessing game. It's as much of as much as we like to think, oh, he looks a player at that level, he should be able to take a step in his stride. It's not just about your ability, it's about your mentality. And ultimately, you don't know until you put somebody into that position if they can handle it. At Celtic, the demand is that you do not make mistakes, or if you do make a mistake, it's one a season and you recover from it. At Hibs, you maybe get slightly more leeway. You can make a few more mistakes per season and you get away with it as long as you're still making good saves. You're going into an old firm game at Ibrox, 50,000 people, you're the Celtic goalkeeper. That's a completely different level of pressure to being the Hibs goalkeeper or the Hearts goalkeeper in front of 15, 20,000 people. I know people will say ultimately it's just the same game, but it's a totally different ball game in terms of Celtic is just such a step up from everything else in Scottish football. So, I mean, Marciano, I'm not saying he wouldn't be able to do it, but there's no guarantees. I mean, to be honest, the fact he's playing in Scotland may help him. He knows the environment. He knows, I mean, he's played for Israel. So maybe he is equipped to make up the step up. I mean, he is a very good goalkeeper. There is, he's Maybe he is worth taking a punt on, giving him a chance. Marciano, um, for me, he's, he's like, he, he, he screams at the boy Zaluska that Celtic got years ago for Dundee United. He's, he'd come in and he'd be a, a, a very, very good number two. Well, there but we go. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see him being, yeah, I don't see him being like streets ahead of Scott Bain even. You know what I mean? I think Celtic need to, uh, if, if I was Eddie Howe, I think a goalie is probably the big one of the big statement signings you need to make. Obviously, you need to replace um, Edward if he leaves because he's your number one striker. That's probably the most important position. Scott Brown's influence in the team needs to be try to, they need to try and replicate that. But goalkeeper, you know as well as I do, Sammy, if you've got a solid keeper and can get a reasonably good defence in front of that, that's the start of a title winning team. It yep. doesn't like you, you. If you've got a solid base, that's what you need to start with. So I mean, I'm not even sure Marshall Marshall's the answer to that either. I, I don't really put yeah. Marshall on that level. I mean, one we're talking about it there. I mean, that's they basically they need a top goalkeeper. They need a top striker. They, they need, need two, at two least centre one centre back, probably two. Yeah. And they need a Scott Brown replacement. Whether that comes from within, whether Callum McGregor just goes into that position, I don't know. But I mean, basically the whole spine of the team is needing upgraded significantly. Yeah, I mean, how do you yeah. do that in a summer? On I know. Cel- as much as Celtic will have money to throw at it, do they have enough to... I mean, that's is, at least thing, five like, calibre signings are going to need. If a manager comes in, and even if you're saying, I mean, giving them the benefit of the doubt, if they have a 60, 65% success rate with the signings that they make, even at that, Celtic would still be mm. short, mile short. They're going to need to really be like lucky in their recruitment and look find try and find gems if they can. But I think this could be a summer that Celtic have to spend a lot of money. They have uh, to try and go and match. Anthony, you mentioned there that obviously the the whole spine of the team are, and a goal scorer is required. I mean, Jim's comment here I think would be a great shout. If Fulham go down, I wonder if Mitrovic would be out of our financial range. Obviously, Jim, a Celtic fan there, but what has he scored five goals for Serbia there in the international break? I mean. He knows where the back of the net is. If Fulham do go down, I think anybody that would just snap him up, whether that be Celtic or another club. I th- Sammy, I reckon he's on a hundred grand a week. Easy, easy. <laughs> really? Honestly, like, I'm not joking. I think he will be on big, big money. Oh, um, well, there we go. So, I don't think that's coming to Celtic part then. Uh, some of these guys, like you, you look at them and think that. that I mean, you, you, a perfect example, and I'm, I'm not talking. This is the hundred grand bracket. But the guy Joel Pereira that came that played for Hearts last season on loan from Manchester United was probably the worst goalkeeper I've ever seen play for Hearts. He's on 20 grand a week at Man United. And that's obviously peanuts to them. But that's just, he came to Hearts and we're getting, we're getting a 20 grand a week goalkeeper. He was terrible, right? So the, the money that's, that's in England, is it, it just blows teams like Celtic out of the water. Like any reasonably top level player, and I'm not saying Mitrovic is, is in that bracket, but Mitrovic should be a player that Celtic could be able to get. But because the, the, the market's so inflated in England, it's, it's just, it's, it's almost impossible for them to go and get guys like that, eh? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned... the Rangers, Rangers have built. I mean, they've built a real team of substance now, the sort of team that Celtic will be looking to build. But Rangers have had to be really clever with the recruitment. They've not signed established top end players. They've signed players that have almost grown into it at Rangers and guys that maybe weren't 
it wasn't happening for them elsewhere or whatever. And Goldson, for instance, and he's grown to be a top centre back. So you almost you, you probably are going to have to take a few gambles and just hope they pay off. Guys who maybe are a little bit lost down in England or are not quite they're not quite at the level you want just yet, and you're just going to have to be a wee bit patient with them and let them find their feet and grow into that player. I suppose very much like what happened with Edward. You bring him in from Paris. He was relatively unknown, but obviously a high pedigree player by Scottish standards and he grew to be a top class striker in Scotland. But again, there's no guarantee these signings work. That's why this is such a a tricky summer for Celtic to negotiate. And there is absolutely no guarantee that regardless of how good Eddie Howe is, there is no guarantee that things are going to work out brilliantly, certainly in the short term. Yeah, exactly. Um, This is something we've talked about mm, quite a bit since it happened. Um, We should never let Craig Gordon go. I mean, Hearts were grateful for Craig Gordon's wonder save as they edged closer to the Scottish Championship title with a goalless draw at East End Park at the weekend. It finished on Fernland nil, Hearts nil. Scotland goalkeeper somehow got his body in front of a header in the closing stages to make sure that they secured the point. Uh, the pars hit the crossbar earlier as Robbie Nielsen's men rode their luck to the fourth game without victory. Now, Stephen, you, you had a good rant about the whole top-to-bottom function of Heart of Midlothian on last week's show. Are you OK this week, hon? I am, mate, thank you. As I said in the show during the week, I found it very cathartic. It it really helps me. Therapeutic. Anger. (laughs) Yeah. um, It was, uh, listen, it it was no surprise to me that they drew 0 0. I was predicting a 0 0 draw about four or five days before the game even came about because I just thought, uh, 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 to me, I know that that, that league is so topsy turvy and there's, there's, there's no consistency in any of the teams, including Hearts at this moment in time. Um, but I, I watched that Dunfermline team play Wraith during the week and they got absolutely battered 5-1 by Wraith and it could have been double figures. Wraith were absolutely, like, just took it to them. And they then play Hearts and, I, and I'm thinking, oh, right, OK, well, at least at least I know we're going to get a few chances today, if nothing else. And 0-0 n- n- flat of Hearts. It could, have, it could have easily been three or four goals for Dunfermline. I mean, you could say that, obviously... Defensively, Hearts probably did a little bit better than, than what they have been doing of, of recent times. And I think Shea Logan was was good at right back. Michael Smith playing centre half was a bit a bit they looked a bit more solid there. But it's it's just it's just pathetic, to be honest. Two two wins in nine. Um since the turn of the year, they've just been they've just, just been laughable, to be honest. And and I just don't see it getting any better. And I understand that they're trying to show a bit of loyalty and they're they're trying to maybe see if they can ride out this period where Robbie's still in charge. But I think the damage is done now. I mean, and that's that's not just because I had a rant about it last week. I think you, you look at any polls, there was a poll on Jambo's kickback, there was a poll in the evening news. Each one of them, in between 88 and 90% against Robbie Nielsen. How do you turn that around? You can't. Yeah. So... Uh- I mean, that's the two talking points tonight. show. Celtic closing and appointing a new manager and what is the future for Robbie at Tynecastle. Uh, Anthony, former Aberdeen boss Derek McInnes, says he's enjoying a break from football but admits he may not be able to resist the right opportunity to return to management. Is that him getting the fly rod out and just casting one out there saying, Hearts, come and get me? Possibly, yeah. Um, I mean, I said last week, I think he is the absolute standout candidate for Hearts if they were to go looking for a new manager at any point in the near future and particularly now while he's available he's a guy who's done exactly what Hearts need to get in the coming years he's finished he's taken a team at Aberdeen from the bottom six which they were when he took over from Craig Brown in 2013 and he made them a consistent top four team consistent top two team to be honest while Rangers were out of the league and then certainly a consistent top three team until the last couple of years and even then, in that period where he was supposed to have lost his way, he still had them in the top four. And as bad a season as they're perceived to have had this year, they're going to finish in the top four again. So, I mean, for all these flaws or perceived flaws, he's still a consistent top four manager. And you, you ask any Hearts fan, what do they want? They want to be in the top four and they want to be challenging for cups. Derek McInnes won one cup and he also got to several finals. And had it not been against Brendan Rodgers Celtic, I dare say he would have won more than the one cup. He'd have probably had at least two or three. Very unfortunate that when you come up against Brendan Rodgers Celtic in a cup final, the chances of you winning are very, very limited, no matter how good your own team is. So I don't, I mean, we've debated Derek McInnes so much on this show in the past few months in terms of his reign at Aberdeen and his 
overall sort of his CV, his track record in terms of league finishes and what have you, and there is no way you can convince me that he would not be a perfect choice for Harps. He's regard the concerns about style of play, they go out the window if you're consistently finishing top four and getting to cup semi-finals and cup finals. This I've said before, this style of play thing is a red herring. It's you can use it to sort of uh, you, if things are not going your way, it's another thing to throw on the style of play is rubbish and what have you. But as long as you you're consistently getting the team in the top four, qualifying for Europe, the style of play thing for me is it does not matter. I don't ever remember Hearts being a swashbuckling team apart from that little period under George Burley and probably 1998 under Jim Jeffries. From and to be honest, the best have been since then is probably a couple of games under Daniel Stendel when they got relegated. So. The style of play, I mean, you hear Hibs fans banging on about Jack Ross's perceived style of play. Hibs are about to have one of their best seasons on record, or certainly in the 21st century. So anybody complaining about Jack Ross's style of play just needs their head examined. I mean, I don't understand that argument. You're about to finish in third place in the league for the first time in 16 years, and yet still you nitpick about the style of play. Like, get a grip. It's the, the style of play thing, ultimately... Football is about winning games. It's about scoring goals. Hibs are scoring goals, winning games. If Hearts are finishing in the top four, then it means they're winning more games than not. And that's exactly what they've been crying out for for the last, certainly the last five years, most of the last 10 years. And to be honest, most of the last, since Craig Levine left the first time, they've been very much in and out of the top four. They've never really been settled in the top four for any period of time. So, Derek McInnes is the closest thing I think you could get to a guarantee of getting back into the top four. So if you're asking me, would he be the right man for Hearts if they were to get rid of Robbie Nielsen? Then yes, 100%. Or, but having said that, Alex Neal, I think, would be a very good candidate as well. But I think Derek McInnes is the one that if you hire him, you know you're pretty much guaranteed to get yourself. It gives you the best possible chance of getting back into the top four. Yeah, if we look at other results at the weekend, it finished Rangers 4, Cove Rangers 0 in the Scottish Cup. Rangers set up an old firm derby with Celtic in the fourth round of the Scottish Cup after they easily dispatched Cove Rangers at Ibrox. Now, the two Glasgow rivals will go head-to-head at Ibrox on the 17th or 18th of April. Stephen, how important is it that Celtic redeem some... What's the word I'm looking for? Some pride and dispatch your Rangers on the 17th or 18th of April? Because that would be possibly the fifth Scottish Cup win in a row for Celtic. Is that something that would maybe make up for such a poor season? Uh, I don't think it's going to make up for anything. Oh, well, it'll, it'll partly make up, I would say. I think it's important. It's definitely important because it's literally the only competitiveness left in the Scottish League at this moment in time. You know what I mean? Like the, the, It's the only thing that teams have got to play for in terms of the league's tied up, the League Cup's finished. So this is the only competitiveness. Rangers, Rangers are out of Europe. So every all the eggs are in this basket now. And I think for Celtic, it's probably more important because they need to try and just, just land a blow. Land a blow on Rangers because as it looks like Rangers are, like to all intents and purposes, it looks like Rangers have completely turned this Celtic juggernaut around. And if Celtic were to then go and win the Scottish Cup again, it just shows a little bit of, listen guys, we're not going away. We're still here. Even with a poor team, even with no, well, it depends if Eddie Howe's in charge or at that point or whether they, they stick with the kind of temporary setup until the end of the season. You don't know. If Eddie Howe is in charge or, or another manager is in charge of the team at this point, it's a very difficult game because it could, could potentially be one of his first matches. That is, that's like a baptism of fire going into that game. But I just think if, if Celtic can show the same sort of level of performance that they have done in the last two old firm matches, I think they've got a chance. I, I don't think Rangers have really been at it the last two matches, but have so, somehow managed to come come away with four points. This being a cup tie, I think there needs to be a bit more cutthroat necessarily, so, so a, bit, a bit more of an edge about the game. Rangers wouldn't be able to just go and settle for a point and being at Ibrox is a, again, it's, it goes against Celtic. But if by some chance they could they could get some they, they could win this game, it just gives them one less of a hurdle to jump for next season. We've obviously talked at length earlier about what what sort of a build it rebuild job that they've got. 
these you've got to remember a lot of these players are still the players that, that played under Brendan Rodgers and th- that is the nature of football not just in Scotland that one bad season and people are written off there are still yeah. players in that squad who 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 had massive success with Brendan Rodgers and if they could win this trophy I'm not saying that it, it, it puts them back on that pedestal but it, it keeps them in the minds of the, the new manager coming in to say listen I'm not as washed up as people may think I am I'm still able to do a job for you going forward and it may be that Eddie Howe gets a tune out of some of these guys who have failed to give a tune for, for the last two managers Yeah, I mean sticking with Scottish Cup and Anthony you mentioned uh, Jack Rossi's Hibs there in action tonight they're down at Palmerston against Queen of the South in the Scottish Cup, um, obviously Queen of the South are on not too bad form, they disposed of Hearts recently Stephen, um, do you think Jack Ross is going to rock up <laughs> think Jack Ross is going to rock up there and get through the next round of the cup easy enough or is, is Queen of the South going to put up a fight do you think um, who are you talking to Semi yes yeah, yourself Anthony on you right. go sorry <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking forward to this game tonight I think it'll be a good game to watch um, I think it's certainly got potential for an upset I, th- I don't think it'll be an easy one for Hibs at all I think uh, certainly Hibs are consistent enough that they could go down there and win 2 or 3-0, they've certainly got that in their locker but equally I think there's not that big a gulf whereby it would be a major upset if Queen of the South were to win tonight. I think we've obviously seen last week Queen of the South went to Tynecastle and won pretty impressively at Tynecastle, 3-2 uh, 2-0 up after 20 minutes albeit aided by some terrible Hearts defending and uh, Queen of the South made it really difficult for Hearts at Palmerston a couple of months ago in the, in the Friday night game I dare say Hibs will be a tougher challenge for Queen of the South than what Hearts have been in the last two games, but I don't think it's beyond them to at least make the tie competitive. Um, I think the Hibs will be very mindful of the fact that um, as good as their season has been in the league, they have had two big cup semi-final disappointments in the Scottish Cup against Hearts and St. Johnson. And I think they're the two big blemishes on Jack Ross's record this season in the eyes of the supporters so if he was to go out against Queen of the South tonight then that would suddenly turn a good season into a very I don't know about a bad one but suddenly you've gone out of three cups against teams that ordinarily you would hope to beat if you're a Hibs fan so I think Jack Ross will be very mindful of the need I mean it's easier said than done but the need to ensure that there are no slip-ups tonight because a defeat tonight to Hibs, as much as I'm saying it's possible and I wouldn't be overly surprised by it, it would certainly be very damaging to Jack Ross in the eyes of the supporters on the back of the two semi-final defeats. I feel like he needs to have a really good run at this Scottish Cup. He, the, cha- the the odds suggest, I mean, the odds on any team winning the Cup is against you because it's more likely than not that you're not going to win it. But I think if he's going to go out, he needs to get quite far into the tournament and at least make sure he's going out against a Celtic or a Rangers or a team of certainly similar calibre to him. So he can't, I don't think he can afford any slip-ups against teams certainly from the league below. So there is pressure on Hibs in that regard, but certainly Hibs do have enough quality in their ranks to get through with a bit to spare if they turn up and play as they can do. But equally, I would not be surprised if this game gets quite difficult for Hibs and they end up having to scrap it out or even get taken to a replay or even get beat. I'm not, I don't think that's entirely... There's no, no replays, good. mate. It's straight straight oh. extra time and pens. Right, well, there you go. It could. I mean, it could become a sticky night for Hibs in that regard if it's Tetchy going into the closing stages. I mean, I, I, I would, you'd fancy Hibs. I mean, Hibs are a stronger team on paper, yeah. obviously, but I would not be surprised in the slightest if it becomes a sticky night for them. It's I obviously think Hibs- I think Hibs will win comfortably, to be honest. It's an artificial think, park down there as well, isn't it, though, which might play against Hibs, but... But they, they, they train on that every day. I mean, I know teams like will, will always talk about that artific- artificial surface, and Robbie Nielsen has used it on more than a few occasions this season, despite the fact that, again, Hearts train on it every single day. But I just think, I, I think Hibs have got that that sort of professional professionalism through them. I think they've got a team of guys who can grind out a game, who can get in front of the game and coast, they, they have got a strong, strong team, Hibs. And I think that they, the way that Jack Ross has got them set up on the majority of occasions I've watched them is that they, they are workmen. Like, they get the job done, they go about and they just dispatch teams. And I think if they can get ahead pretty early in this game, um, which they're more than capable of doing, I think it could be a comfortable night. But I think what, what Tony was saying is right, that the longer the game goes on, the more 
so uh, maybe the doubts that will be in in the Hibs players' minds, and also the more strength of character you'll maybe see from Queen of the South. Um, but you look you look at the the way that the draws kind of panned out for Hibs as well. If they if they can get through this tie, they're I think they play Stranraer in the next round. Then you've got Aberdeen and Livingston are playing each other. Rangers and Celtic are playing each other. So they, there there is a kind of potential pathway there for Hibs to to get quite deep into the competition. And if they can get deep into the competition, as as Tony says, if if they get knocked out by whoever comes through in the Rangers and Celtic game or Aberdeen, then fair play. Like any any of these teams can beat each other potentially on their day. But if they, if they go out to a Queen of the South or a Stranraer, then I mean, who am I to sit and judge any team after my team got knocked out by a Highland League team? But at the same team, at the same time, sorry, I, I think if you're Hibs, you're probably looking for more than that because in a similar vein to what we were just saying about Rangers and Celtic. The third place is pretty much tied up in that in the league. I know it's not officially, but Hibs would have to go a long, long way to lose that third place now. Yeah. And I think the Scottish Cup will, will probably hold a higher precedence for them. I mean, looking at the Scottish Cup results from the weekend, there wasn't exactly many giant killings. I think the biggest shock was probably Clyde beating Air United 1-0. Uh, Stephen, you mentioned your Highland League team, Brora, that put hearts out. They got put out by Stranraer 3-1 at the weekend. Oh, so, good. Good, I'm glad. Uh, I mean, the Highland League, uh, the, the non-league teams are all out for. Martin got beat 5-0 by Mullerwell. Um, the other only major team that got put out in the, the Premier League Hamilton Aki's got beat 3-0 by St Mirren Kilmarnock disposed of St House Muir 4-0 and Celtic won 3-0 against Falkirk Dundee United were 2-1 victory over Partick Thistle as well and Aberdeen of course it was on the telly beat Dumbarton 1-0 um, just looking at some of the the other fixtures going forward um, to the week I mean tomorrow tonight we've obviously touched on Anthony we've got the Hibs against Queen of the South tomorrow there's championship games at Sierra United against Dundee Greenock Morton are playing Inverness Cali and on Friday it's the return of Hart of Midlothian against Alloa another Friday night fixture for Hearts Anthony um, this is where sort of Robbie's demons first began wasn't it on the telly on a Friday night what, what do you think it is about it is it just sheer sort of are we looking at this too much is it just another game it doesn't matter if it's Friday night and it's on the telly it doesn't matter anymore whether it's Friday night or Saturday afternoon. Hearts are a tough watch at the minute, but certainly I think there's an element of the Hearts support being scarred by Friday night games to the extent that they now dread them. And probably at the start of the season, there was a feeling of, oh, brilliant, we're on the telly tonight, let's get the beers in sort of thing. And now it's like, oh, no, we're on the telly. I don't want to watch this. This could get disastrous. So I think the vibe's definitely changed. But going back to the Scottish Cup there, you, you're reeling off a few results there. I was looking at the, on Friday there, I was looking at the Scottish Cup fixtures and I was thinking, I wonder if any of these results might actually paint Hearts defeat to Brora in a slightly different light. For example, if Motherwell went to Fort Martin and struggled, maybe got held or had a real tough night, people might say, oh, Hearts result wasn't so bad. Or if Brora were to knock Stranraer out, then you might say, actually, they're a decent side and what have you. But I mean, every result pretty much made Hearts look, result look worse. I mean, Motherwell go up there to Highland League team. I know for Martin or not, quite as strong as Brora but they're obviously from the same league and Mother will win 5-0 I mean that's the sort of result that a lot of Hearts supporters would have been hoping for when their own team went up to Brora mm. and then obviously Brora get turned over by Stranraer which many people will argue shows Brora's limitations so even without Hearts being involved in the cup it was a weekend that almost made Hearts result look almost worse than it not worse than it was because it was a terrible result but if there was any hope of Hearts, that result looking slightly better on paper, it didn't materialise in terms of the way the other results went at the weekend. Yeah, I'm just having a look at some of the comments as we go into the last 15 minutes of the show. Uh, hi to Gillian Moon, the Billy Wee, must be a Clyde fan. I mean, just that just come at my head there just now. Obviously, a few years back, Clyde knocked Celtic out as well. It's it's the it's the joy of the cup, isn't it, Stephen? That, that non-league teams, that lower league teams have got the chance to knock out the the higher teams, if you like. It's just the it's the it's I'm trying to make it easier for you, mate. I'm, just... <laughs> not, I'm not finding it very joyful, to be honest. I, I, I get the, the giant killing, and it's a great story for everybody involved. I think we saw in the FA Cup, there was, I can't remember the name of the team, but they played Tottenham. Tottenham, um, yeah. Yeah, and th that that's when Tottenham en ended up selling like 30,000 virtual tickets for them and stuff like that. And those are great stories, and, and they're the kind of things that keep... I mean, Brora Br Br are, are maybe a little bit different because... They are probably going to be a league team. Let's be honest. Next season, they they're, they're a, they are a, a good side for the level they play at. But but it's still Brora. Um, 
So yeah, it's good for the neutral to sort of see these little teams coming in and, and maybe having a go. But for, for, uh, this year of all years should be the year that there should be no giant killings because these lower league, these lower league teams even have have not played for so long, and you've got teams who have played in the, in the Premier League and the Championship have played all the way through. They should have a massive advantage over everybody. So to see even even the likes of Clyde getting a, a result against Air United was was it's maybe on paper not a massive upset, but it's still it's still nice to see that there it's not just hearts that are getting panned out by 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 smaller teams. <laughs> there we go. I mean, Jim says nothing compares to Berwick Rangers. Obviously, I forget the year, but obviously Berwick Rangers famously knocked Rangers out of the cup. I remember as a youngster maybe one of the first ever football games I went to my, with my granda um, to go watch was Whitehill Welfare against Celtic at Easter Road obviously Celtic won 3-0 but you had the likes of Van Hoydonk De Canio um, I mean there were some great players in that team and like, like I say that was just the, the beauty of a small team from a wee town in, called Rosewell in Midlothian getting to take on the giants of Scottish football I mean and they've done themselves proud that's just the joy of the Scottish Cup um, Anthony I'll stick with you do you do you dare say who you think at this stage is going to go on and win the Scottish? A prediction from both of you? I'll give you mine. Um, oh. I predicted Hearts would win it a couple of weeks ago. So <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> Take my prediction with a pinch of salt. Um, I think I'm going to go for Rangers. Rangers. I think they'll have the bit between their teeth. They'll want to just cap what's been a pretty memorable season with uh, more silverware. So I'll go for them. But equally... It's, uh, the, the old firm game opens it up obviously because you've got a chance of anybody else getting to the final basically um, aye, I'll go for Rangers Steven. I'm going to go for Celtic just to be just to, just to mix it up I'm going to go for Celtic I think Celtic win it win at Ibrox and then batter everybody in their path I'm going to go for, I'm going to go for a, an out there one right an out there one and I'm going to see St Johnston I'm going to see St Johnston are going to do the cup double it's actually not a bad shout um, but, well, uh, there we go. I'm going to check I, check the odds on that when we come off here. Uh, 1967 apparently was the year that Berwick knocked uh, Rangers out of the cup. Thanks for the comment on that one. Um, if you ever look at some of the fixtures coming up uh, at the weekend, uh, Celtic versus Livingston. We've got Hamilton Ackies against Dundee United, Kilmarnock Cross County, Mullerwell against St Mirren, and St Johnston against Aberdeen. Um, I'm not up to speed with this, but I know you will be, Stephen. What is the current situation at Aberdeen then? When will Stephen Glass and Scott Brown take over? Are that going to be as of the end of this season? Well, no. Scott Scott Brown obviously doesn't join until the end of mm. next season. But the re- So the only reason that Stephen Glass wasn't in charge on their game on Saturday is because he's lived in America for so long, he isn't registered with the NHS here. So they're obviously in the process of getting their vaccinations for the COVID-19. So he has to stay in America until he can get his second vaccination, or or I don't know if it's just one vaccination that they get, but he has to basically get his vaccination in America because if he was to come here, he would then have to, like, he would have to quarantine when he comes back, which he will have to do anyway, and then wait his turn until he can get the vaccination somehow through the NHS. So I think it was just easier for, for just him and his family to be able to get the vaccination sorted out in America first and then come across. And obviously Aberdeen have already got a management structure in place at this moment in time. It's not like they're having to, they were having to scramble around and have players that were picking the team and things like that. So no doubt he's, he's probably had a say in who's getting picked and things like that. But Barry Robson and uh, and Paul Sheeran are going to continue, I think, until, until such time as he's medically safe to come across here. Um, so I, I, I don't think there's a, any mad rush. I think if Aberdeen had lost that game or, or drawn, went to extra time, and if they had lost that tie, I think uh, at the weekend there would have been a bit more of a, an outcry for it. But he's uh, that, that's the reason. So he will he will take up charge of Aberdeen as soon as he's across here, but that's the reason why he's not arrived in the country yet. And just to clarify, Scott Brown's role, he's, he's obviously signed as a player as well. Is he going to be player coach or is he assistant manager? I'm, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure. The, the official statement said player coach. But obviously, all the chat prior to it being ratified was that he was going as as his assistant. They, they've obviously they've announced Alan Russell as well, which was mm-hmm. the worst kept secret in Scottish football. Um, he's going to come in, but yeah, again, he's more of a kind of specialist. I think he does a lot of the set piece work for England and works with the strikers. So he's probably coming in as a maybe a more of a generic coaching role. 
Scott Brown, to me, I, I mean, I, I don't know the ins and outs of how it's going to work, but I don't see how a player could also be the assistant manager. I just, to me, that doesn't work. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I know it probably has done, it has worked at previous clubs and things like that, but the, the assistant manager's role and whether Scott Brown's the captain with an armband on his arm or not, he will be the captain of that team because of just the way he is and the way he plays. So to me, you can't be the captain and the assistant manager. You, those are sort of two defined roles. The assistant manager is the guy that kind of goes in there and has an arm around the player's shoulder and is laughing and jokey. He's the kind of connect between the, the manager and the, the coaching staff. So it, to me, it's crying out. I've said this, I think I've said this on the show a couple of times. It's crying out for an experienced guy to come in there and be the assistant manager, because at this moment in time, you've got three young, hungry guys that are going to come in there and, and potentially do a good job. But if you just had a, a bit of an old war horse there as a as an assistant, to someone to bounce ideas off and just to, uh, to be the voice experience, to sort of calm people down when it's when it, when you're in the heat of battle, just as someone who's been there and done that and bought the T-shirt, if you could, could find someone who's out of a job. I mean, I, I said a couple of weeks ago, someone like Andy Watson, who was... Uh, Alex McLeish's assistant for so long and he's obviously got, got a tie-in with Aberdeen. If you, could, if you could get someone like that to come in and just work as almost like a mentor for, for the, the coaching staff, I think it would be a great move. Eh? Yeah, no, just looking at some of the comments again. Um, player assistant um, and then someone else has said player coach for the Bruni one. So even people on the comments, people watch the show, there's not 100% they're sure that, oh yeah, he's going in as assistant manager and a player, or he's going in as a player and a coach. There's a bit of confusion. Anthony, you know Scott Brown, he's, he's so passionate on the park. I mean, can you see that being the kind of sort of coach, assistant manager, whatever role he's going to take up in the dugout? Um, do you think that's going to be the kind of person he's going to be in the dugout as he was in the park? Uh, I think he was probably earmarked to be an assistant manager initially, and then obviously there was a lot of backlash from the Aberdeen supporters because of his history with the sort of Shea Logan incident a few years back with Tonev. Um, so I wonder if Aberdeen have just been a wee bit tactful by just saying he's going to be a coach at the moment until he sort of gets his feet under the table, as opposed to billing him as an assistant manager or um, an assistant coach. I think generally he's there for his presence as a, a motivator, a leader. Um, obviously he will get involved with the coaching, I would imagine, but to what extent, I don't know. If he's still planning on playing week in, week out, can he then take coaching sessions? I don't know the dynamic of that, how that would work. Um, but certainly, I think primarily he'll be in there to be a positive influence in the dressing room, to be the sort of guy that ensures Aberdeen are a competitive force and have the right mentality to go and keep themselves at the top end of the table. I mean, I think any club in Scotland, as much as Scott Brown is a sort of pantomime villain who supporters of rival clubs love to hate. If I was putting together a, a football club that wanted to compete at the top end of Scottish football, I would want Scott Brown in there, whether he's a coach, a player, a ma not necessarily a manager, but I would want a guy of his sort of his mentality, his drive, his desire to win, his professionalism, because he is. It's Scott Brown puts on this persona that he's a madman, a maniac or whatever, but I've spent time in his company. He's actually a very sort of gentle guy away from football, very likable guy, very humble guy. And uh, as much as he can rub people up the wrong way with the way he behaves on a football pitch, he's proved himself over the best part of a decade and a half that he is a, a longer than that, even if you factor in his time at Hibs, where he was one of their best players, arguably their best player for three or four years before he got his move to Celtic. I mean, he's been one of the most dominant characters in Scottish football in the last 20 years. Anybody who doesn't want them in their team is cloud allowing his sort of persona to cloud their judgment because he's he's a good operator, he's a he's a quality operator in terms of the Scottish football landscape. He he is an asset to any club in Scotland, out with Rangers obviously for obvious reasons, but he he is the sort of guy that you would want in your club in some capacity. Whether he's a coach, whether he's a player, he will be an asset to Aberdeen. I'm very confident of that. Yeah, Jelly makes a, a great point here. I love this. If this was to happen, Celtic Aberdeen final will be interesting. Imagine that Scott Brown's farewell game, the last game they will play for Celtic mm. against the possible, well, not possible, it is the team he's going to be going to. That would be a very interesting cup final. Uh, thanks to Ian as well for this. This is just, this is my sort of level of comedy. Love this. Jesus Christ. <laughs> 
<laughs> Obviously, I came in when we were talking about Stephen Glass. Love it, Ian. Keep them coming, mate. I do love that. Um, just finally, some of the other fixtures coming up this weekend in the Championship. It's Air United against Dunfermline. Dundee take on Green at Morton. It's Queen of the South against Inverness Cali Thistle. And Rafe Rovers are at home against our Broth. One game on Sunday at Ibrox. It's Rangers against Hibernian. It should be a good game. I, I mean, where does the time go? That's an hour up already, guys, on another episode of the Play on Scottish Football Show. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thanks for everybody that has... Uh, Pulled in the comments, there's one that's just come in that agrees with me. That's an absolute beauty. Gillian, I haven't even considered that. I mean, that see if that happens. That'll be superb. Because how does Scott Brown conduct himself? Nah, Scott Brown conducts himself the same way he would in any other game. He would go out and try and win that match. He would do everything in his power to win that game. Despite the fact he was going to Aberdeen the next season, he would go, want to go there as a Scottish Cup, the only person in the dressing room with a Scottish Cup medal. Um, I've got no doubt about that. <laughs> like I say, the hour has just flown past. It's been an absolute pleasure having you all on board. On behalf of myself, Stephen Collins and Anthony Brown, thanks for watching. And we'll see you again next Monday at same time, same place for another episode of the Play on Scottish Football Show.